All right, in this next section, we're going to talk about yet another controversial topic, the topic of vascular restraint, aka chokeholds. Now, chokes as a restraint and intervention tactic have garnered a somewhat negative reputation. Starting as early back as the early 1980s and certainly up to uh, recent history, we've seen a number of uses of chokes that seem egregious and excessive where individuals have been seriously injured if not killed. Now, the first thing we have to understand is that there are two fundamental ways to affect and restrain somebody uh, through neck restraint. The first is what is termed vascular restraint, whereby we are sealing off the arteries on either side of the neck. For this to work, we must have pressure evenly or somewhat evenly applied on both arteries. We can't simply seal one artery and create any kind of uh, significant effect. The second is by affecting the trachea and sealing oxygen flow. Some people are very resistant to the pain and they'll endure it to the point that the trachea gets damaged, gets cracked, and the person starts to bleed in effect, uh, drowning in their own blood, bleeding into the lungs. In other cases, the trachea can get kind of crimped or, or crinkled a little bit inside and it doesn't reopen and the person starts wheezing and has trouble breathing. Uh, in other cases, the sheer panic of prolonged application triggers a very primal resistance. People start fighting for their life. The officers intervening then perceive this as resistance, so they put more pressure, more pressure, more pressure, escalating it up needlessly um, to a serious injury, if not death. Vascular restraint, by comparison, is a very quick and reliable method. Usually can occur anywhere as quick as four to six seconds, but usually about 10 to 13 seconds, person's gonna go out if we have a correct, uh, correctly applied it. Now what I've done is I've taken our Bob statue and I've taken a little piece of crinkly plastic bottle and I've just taped it in the place of the trachea. Now, keep in mind this is a rather pronounced trachea, it's exceeding his chin, but it's just to reinforce the absolute uh, importance of minimizing pressure on the trachea. Conventional old school chokes, what uh, in Jiu Jitsu is known as Hadaki Jimmy, is to place the forearm directly across the windpipe, to clap the hands together, and to pull back, and you can hear the pressure on the trachea. Conventional vascular restraint should have one bicep sealing one artery, the forearm sealing the second artery, and we know we have good alignment if our elbow is in line with the chin. Now, having this position is not enough. A lot of people imitate the pose of vascular restraint, but then rather than sealing the arteries with a scissoring action that pushes the wrist to the shoulder, they assume the position and then pull back. And by pulling back, they again put pressure on the trachea. So again, I should cuff bicep into one side, forearm on the other, and I should be pushing the forearm into the shoulder, into the bicep. The minute I start to pull back, now I'm placing that pressure back on the trachea. This gets significantly worse when we see people going to what is commonly termed a figure four position. The figure four position should amplify this compression of hand to shoulder. Therefore, a very simple drill for learning this is to imagine hitchhiking the thumb into the shoulder, squeezing as hard as I can. There is negligible pressure on the trachea. My second hand should support by pushing onto the wrist, and then if I do decide to protect my fingers by sealing up into a figure four, I go to the back of the head, close my fingers, and squeeze the elbows together as if my elbows want to touch. What I do not do is push the head forward, or kink the neck out of alignment, or pull the bottom elbow back like I'm cutting the throat. Because in that case, I'm putting significant pressure on the trachea. Now, a lot of sports systems like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and Judo have all manner of chokes in them, but they don't place a huge emphasis on the difference between sealing the breath and sealing the, uh, the blood. In conventional Jiu Jitsu, there was a world of difference, and vascular restraint was used to ensure that there was no injury or damage uh, possibly occurring to the subject. Where it gets confusing is if I go to perform a vascular restraint, but my elbow is slightly out of alignment, the moment that elbow is to the side, I am now de facto putting pressure on the trachea with my forearm, which defeats the entire purpose. And so when we look at law enforcement scenarios where people have had very, very grave consequences to their choke, we often see people assuming the posture of a vascular restraint, but then leaning over to one side. Now hanging, putting the pressure onto the choke, 
or onto the trachea or else leaning the head forward putting additional pressure on the trachea. In Kansas City, there's a method that's been trademarked which is known as lateral vascular restraint because they identified first that this failing to get the elbow in alignment with the chin was oftentimes due to the comparative difference in size between individuals. If I go belly to back, even against a much smaller opponent, the moment they lean forward, I may not have that perfect elbow to chin alignment. But if by comparison I open my body to a perpendicular angle, therefore lateral vascular restraint, my elbow can now thread through much more deeply. Belly to back, this might be the deepest I can go. I open my door and now my elbow can go much more deeply. So the first element to vascular restraint was to have this lateral perpendicular orientation. The second was to recognize that just because I've caught the head, snared it in this manner, doesn't mean that I need to use the choke. One of the most important things I learned as a doorman is that you can choke super well but too fast and then you have somebody that is cumbersome to move or collapsing at the wrong moment. I can in effect catch a vascular restraint and use an uncompressed vascular restraint as a head steer. This is basically a, a slightly modified version of a harness at this point where I'm moving the person from one foot to another or else bumping them back but again putting the majority of the pressure here on the chest. If you'll notice, I, once I've got this catch, I'm going to put all my weight right here and I'm going to pull back and there's a space of a halo around Bob's throat. I'm not in any way putting pressure on the trachea. I'm in effect cuffing the neck and using this as my steering position. So first was to recognize that we want to be perpendicular. Second is to recognize that just because I've snared the neck doesn't mean I need to necessarily be choking at all or all the time. I can use this as a fundamental steering position by clasping my hands together and driving it down to the trapezius and the collarbone. Third, I should recognize that in the exact same way that I can steer, just like a harness, I can bump somebody, we used to call this footballing, and I can walk them. At any point I can pulse the choke on or release it, tighten it, or loosen it, and I can guide them anywhere I need to, including into a harness or into a seated position. Just like the harness can be used as a very valid control mechanism, even in a seated position, the choke snare, the catch of the neck, remains an extremely important control position at all heights, whether I'm on my back or on top, whether I'm standing at three quarters or sitting the subject down, and I can at any point choose to apply the chokehold or to reduce the pressure or to eliminate the choke altogether and simply use it as a cuffing position. Now, because of all of the negative social pressure that we see, many of the departments I encounter are increasingly placing chokes at higher levels of force. In some departments, they're saying, just don't use it, it's too dangerous. What I will tell you, and I've said this elsewhere, I cannot fathom having survived what I survived, particularly against the larger intoxicated or drugged individuals. When we have people in states of very high delirium or excitation, very aggressive, for whom distance, time, verbal de-escalation, and all the rest of it has failed, when we have somebody in that type of a state who is extremely tolerant to pain, who is stronger than you because they're not having any of the normal inhibitions uh, that, that they should as a human, in that case, we have two choices, to cause severe, severe stopping harm, affecting them biomechanically, damaging their body, if not killing them, or else a good vascular restraint. And the majority of the time in my career, I used vascular restraint with tremendous effect and no permanent injury to put people in these states down. So I cannot fathom how I would have survived without it. So what I would say, to all of those who are now fearful of using vascular restraint. Even if we must escalate it from a fourth or fifth level of force, even if we had to, worst case scenario, put it on par with lethal force. If I had the opportunity to apply vascular restraint over a sidearm, I would always choose vascular restraint, assuming it was safe for me to do. Vascular restraint is controllable, it is reliable, I can reproduce the results and have a thousand times in training and a hundred times out in real world application. 
vascular restraint might have a negative reputation, but there's no reason to fear it if we're well trained. So even if I'm working in an apartment wherein I am now required to relegate it to a higher level of force, I'm not going to fear vascular restraint and it's always going to be a reliable go-to before I make the decision to go to lethal force.